But talking about uh, swing and uh, swing rhythms, let's, let's give a little example in the rhythm section of something that we like to do. We like to uh, use as a uh, arrangement um, orchestrational tool uh, playing in two and playing in four. Can anyone tell me the difference between playing in a two feel uh, versus playing in a four feel when we play swing? Does anybody have an idea on that? It feels slower, kind of. Sure, yeah, yeah. The two feel feels a little bit slower, okay? It might be the same tempo, but it's got a more relaxed feel, right? Yeah. Are there any other differences? Why don't we just show you? So um, let's, let's hear a two feel first. Uh, we'll play it on a blues. Go ahead and play a B flat blues, whatever. All right, now let's hear a four feel. So remember what you just saw and heard, students, and now we're gonna go on to a four feel and see what the differences are. Gentlemen. All right, students, so what did you see that was different in the bass player? So you got, yeah, he was like moving his uh, like hand faster, kind of yeah, yeah. using so more of the moving fingerboard. his hand faster. He's going around the fingerboard a lot more, sure. And it really, it, from a very basic standpoint, um, the first time when we were playing in a two feel, he's playing half notes, right? Then when he's playing in a four feel, quarter notes. Very very simple thing, but it's very effective in changing the energy of the of and the sound of the song. What about the drummer? Was well, there anything different that the drummer did? <laughs> the two feel is more like I'm not explaining. Yeah, the two feel is more laid back, and it felt a little more uh, no because the ride felt more open on the four feel. Absolutely, so you mentioned the ride symbol. Uh, on the two feel, he's typically, not always, but typically, he likes to use the hi-hat, uh, which is a much more closed sound, right? So we have a difference in orchestration just on the kit alone. So he's, he's choosing to go from the hi-hat in the two feel over to the ride symbol on the four feel. Yeah, very good. And he's playing more quarter notes and more of those quarter notes with skip beats too on the four feel. Yep. So, and what about the guitar? Were there any, any differences there? The chord changes were um, closer together in the four feel than they were in the two feel. The right hand was more active. Yeah, absolutely. That, that right hand in particular was a lot more active. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so, so this is a way that we like to show uh, a difference and build in energy. Um, and uh, one thing that needs to happen uh, if we want to be very smooth and clear about it, our rhythm section needs to listen very carefully to each other to hear where the drummer is on the kit, what the bass player is doing, whether he's playing half notes or quarter notes, you know? And so those are cues that kind of tell the rest of the rhythm section where we're going with the energy of our song, okay? Um, so that's very, very important to have the right balance so that we can all hear and to be able to pay attention to what each other are doing. So let's, let's hear you guys play that uh, Dat Dare tune one more time. Um, when you've got that melody, uh, when that melody is going on, uh, let's hear the rhythm section try to play it in a two feel very clearly. And then once you move on from that melody into the next section, 
maybe ramp it up into a four feel. We'll play a little bit of the solo section through 41 so we can try that four feel. So yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. Let's do pickups to 25 again, guys. Cool. Yeah. So, what's that? Put yourself in a two feel and then ramp up into a four feel together. All right, cool. Pickups to 25, guys. One, two, one, one, two, three. Hey, very, very cool. Great job, guys. Yeah. So, so that time I really heard a very distinct difference between when the rhythm section was playing in a two feel and a four feel. And I really liked it, especially when you launched into that trumpet solo uh, going into the four feel. It gave him a lot of energy to play with. So I, I really like that. Uh, and that's something that you as a rhythm section can uh, communicate with each other about. You must communicate with each other about. Uh, whether it's talking about it beforehand when you want to do it or making uh, the decision in the moment. And your band director is going to help you with those things too. I'm sure he gives you plenty of great instruction on uh, when to play what sort of feel. Uh, but that's, that's something that uh, really needs to be communicated well, both verbally and non-verbally, especially in the rhythm section. Yeah, really great job, guys. I like that. I like that tune. Uh, we're going to play for you now a tune called uh, Take the A Train. And we're going to make sure that we uh, give you this example of uh, the difference between two and four feel and what it, what it can do, especially for a soloist. Um, but this is Take the A Train from uh, the great Duke Ellington band. That was, this was their theme song uh, for Duke Ellington. And uh, it's one that we play in big band all the time and one more that we play in small groups all the time. It's a jazz standard. <laughs>
Thank you. So that is Take the A Train, a great standard. Um, and we talk about standards in jazz. Does, does, do anybody, uh, do any of you know what that means when we say a tune is a standard? Any ideas on that? All right, well, I'll just explain it then. Um, so a standard is a tune that is a a part of our common repertoire. It means that every jazz player should know it. Uh, if you see here, I'm turning around my music stand, uh, and if they turn around their music stands, most of us are not using any music for this tune. Uh, that's because uh, sometimes we call them head tunes. Um, we learn the head, which is the melody, and memorize that, and then we can make an arrangement of that tune as we play. So this is a very important thing, uh, especially when it comes to playing jazz in small groups, is having tunes memorized. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about playing by ear. Um, the way I like to memorize tunes uh, these days is that I don't look at the music at all uh, until after I have listened to it and learned the melody and learned how to solo and improvise over it. I might look at the music if I have some questions. If I'm not sure what a certain chord change is doing at some point, I might say, okay, I'm gonna reference that sheet music. I'll go back and learn it. But if I learn it by, by ear, first of all, from a recording, then I'm gonna remember it much, much better in the future. That's because um, our aural memory is much better than our visual memory, uh, typically. So <clears throat> that's something that with music, It'd be very, very helpful to learn music from recordings. Um, anyway, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the rhythm section did on that tune. And, and I really love playing with these, with these gentlemen here because um, they do a lot of things that make me sound good as a soloist. Um, why don't we talk about that a little bit and talk about space and comping. Um, when I play, I hear them responding to what I do. Are they having trouble listening, hearing? Oh, okay. We lost video for a second. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, lost video? Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Uh, can, can you still hear me? We can. OK, so we'll, we'll try to troubleshoot the video uh, while just talking about some of this stuff, all right? Um, <clears throat> so 
So yeah, let's let's go to the drums first. How do you like to conceptualize uh, uh, comping and space when you're playing with a soloist? Sergeant Cortese, you've got a microphone already. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, so when comping, especially within the rhythm section, the biggest thing I can stress is listen. Have really big ears. Because as a drummer, I'm always listening to the bass player as far as time and things like that. And he's listening to me for that. But I'm also, if you have a guitar player or a piano player, you need to listen to them and what they're doing when they're comping. So the easiest thing to do is to get in each other's way. You all still there? Yeah, there you are. So the easiest thing to do is to get into each other's way because the piano player's playing, and then the guitar player's playing, and the drum's playing the left hand and the snare drum for comping. And then it gets too busy and it's too much, so you need to avoid that. So the biggest thing is, as from a drummer's point of view, is I'm listening to what the guitar player or the piano player is playing, and I'm letting them do their comp and stay out of their way by focusing on time. And maybe every other two bars, maybe other, every other four bars, I might comp something to um, add to what they're doing. So he might be playing some sort of upbeats or something, and I might try and add that. Or I might, if I hear it and I can catch it from listening to the guitar player, I might double it and we play the same thing together. So that's what you want to try to do. It's not an easy thing to do right away. It takes time to learn, and it takes experience to be able to get good at it. But the best way to do it is to be able to play with other, other musicians. Definitely, yeah. All that's really, really great stuff, Sergeant Cortese. And um, some other cool things is, if, if you think about it, when you're playing in a group, especially a group that's very improvisational, you're having a conversation, you're communicating. So. Um, if one person's talking, you know, usually the other person's going to listen. And it's good to create that space. If you hear maybe a horn player um, playing a lot of lines, you might want to lay back for a second. If they're playing a little bit more sustained, you have a little more room to fill some things in. So kind of try and do the opposite. That's one technique you can do to what some of the other players are doing. If there's too much going on, then just lay back a little bit. And less is more. Uh, another fun thing to do is to kind of see what people are throwing at you. And uh, you can lock on to different people's rhythms. If, uh, uh, if a horn player plays a fu uh, kind of a funky note that's uh, a little out of the key, kind of trying to sound outside, you can actually complement that. It's almost like agreeing with somebody making a statement by following them, maybe reharmonizing that note to something kind of fun and experimenting. Uh, I'm also trying to lock on to rhythms that the drummer is giving me sometimes, too. They might give me a phrase in three, four, and I can lock on to the snare drum and all the hits that they're doing. And it's kind of like arranging and composing on the spot together. You got something? Hey, good morning, everybody. So coming from a uh, bass player's role within the rhythm section of a uh, jazz band or jazz combo, um, what I'm primarily doing is I'm playing the tonic of the note. And if you don't know what that means, that just means like if an E flat is written on the page, my first note for that measure is going to be E flat. I'm outlining what that chord is going to be, and I'm playing notes within that chord. So once again, if I have an E flat major, my notes that I would play generally would be E flat, G, B flat, uh, then uh, maybe like the uh, seventh, especially if it's a dominant seventh, you want to highlight that. And between the different styles of, uh, like, let's say if I'm walking a four, you know, uh, <clears throat> quarter notes, I'm highlighting those two and four uh, accents. So generally, we like to think about um, walking a bass line as just being bum, 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 bum. But when I'm walking it, I want to make sure that I'm highlighting what the two and four is, similar as to what the uh, drummer is going to be doing. So instead of just bum, 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 I'm going to be doing like bum, 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 bum. And that's really going to help out with that drive and the momentum that carries out through the entire uh, uh, band in general. Um, the, the last thing I'll say as a bass player is your role is a bass player and you are the keep time 
and harmony. You're not out there to be Jock Pistorius, ruining the sound for the rest of the band. <laughs> but um, a lot of people say the bass player is the most important instrument in a band and in the rhythm section. And it is very easy for you to ruin the sound. So just keep that in mind. Your role isn't to be the star of the show. Your role is to keep that drive and momentum going while at the same time outlining, uh, uh, drawing out those chords. Like there's a time and place to be Jocko Pistorius, I get it, but keep it reserved and know your role as a bass player. All right, great, thank you. Were there, were there any questions before, uh, before we move on to our next topic? quick switches you can make to the way you play to sort of create some contrast, whether it's, you know, changing the guitar comp style or moving around the drum kit or something like that. You know, there's ways to create contrast, you know, between sections or between soloists, something like that. Absolutely. And uh, you'll hear uh, when we play, you'll hear Sergeant Cortese often um, switching up the feel just a little bit between soloists or moving to a different symbol, right? That's something that is really common to do. The biggest thing for the job of a drummer is you want to establish each section. So what that means is you're playing in an A section, you might play a two feel. If you go to the B, you might go to the right symbol. Maybe you play a sol you're playing, the soloist is playing and you're backing them up on a right symbol, but then you hear the harmonic contrast change and you want to change and support that as well. So instead of being over here on the right symbol, I might come over here on the symbol, or if I had another right symbol, just for a different sound source. So you want, you have all these sound sources here, you want to utilize them to the best of your ability in order to support the music. That's your job, aside from keeping time as a drummer. And, and Sergeant Cortese does a really great job for us of very clearly marking out those sections. Another thing that he does sometimes is put a, a little fill going into the next section, right? And so sometimes he'll put a fill or a, some sort of chatter um, as a response to a soloist, and sometimes you'll hear it as part of the form of the tune. So he's really good about doing that, and that's something I really appreciate about him. Um, this, uh, uh, Specialist Maldonado, what, what do you do uh, as far as orchestration that way? So sometimes it's as simple as um, just talking to the band. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll go to the rhythm section, and somebody will say double time. We'll just do, pick the tune double time, or let's go Latin, and we'll, from a swing, just go Latin. So sometimes it's as easy as doing that, but once you get to those different styles, there's so many things you can do, especially on guitar to change things up. Uh, you can change up how many notes you're playing at the same time in your chord voicings. You can uh, do what they call a Freddie Green type thing, where you're playing uh, mostly just guide tones, thirds and sevenths, um, and uh, just kind of you know playing four on the floor. And you can also go to higher frequencies. Let's say a bass player is taking a solo or something. Sometimes it's nice to stay out of their frequency range and uh, play uh, up in the upper register here so you're staying out of that territory. It can be a dynamics thing. You know, maybe you're using your fingers, maybe you're brushing with the fingers. Could you say something about sure. Like the <coughs> yep. Comping uh, in a more modern style? So this, this first example here is how the guitar player for uh, the Count Basie band might play um, and, and comp behind the band, okay? So this is, this is four on the floor, we call it. He's playing all four beats, quarter notes, in the style of Count Basie's guitarist, Freddie Green. So that's something that he might do uh, to evoke a certain sound. If he wants to make it sound a little bit older, like big band sound, it's not something that he'll do often in the jazz combo, but he might use that as a technique or hint at that a little bit more. He might not be on the nose about it as much as that, but he might hint at that a little bit more to get that more classic big band sound. Uh, can you show an example, just play along with him please, uh, of, of comping in a more modern style um, maybe, you know, that post-bop sort of era comping.
there's a very different sound between those two things. And he can go uh, in between the extremes of those and, and anywhere in between to evoke a certain sound or to complement what's going on with the rest of the band. Uh, with that, we're going to go start talking a little bit about playing Latin music. Uh, and we've got uh, our drummer here, our expert on uh, Latin styles. He'll walk you through a little bit of this, uh, give you a good a little introduction here. Hey, sorry, Allison. So do you all have any songs that you're actually doing that are within a Latin style of any kind? Yes, we do, Maybe you can play, Yeah, maybe you can play one for us. You need that? This is a nut of Horace Silver. So it actually goes from Latin to swing and back and forth. So plenty to talk about there. That's perfect. Matthew, Matthew, you agree? Yes. <laughs> awesome, you do? Yeah. All right. One, two, three. Oh. Great job. Great yeah, job. Yeah, Nutville. That's a great so, tune. So, can anyone tell me what Latin style that is? Mambo. Mambo, okay. Uh, another, another style you can probably put in there that might help, which I know that tune is known for, is Sango. Has anyone ever heard of Sango? So, you have heard of Sango? Yes. Yeah. Sweet. So let me just talk to you about Sango just a little bit. If you, if you don't know this already, Sango comes from like the 1970s-ish, late 60s. And a, a percussionist by the name of Changuito played with a group called Los Von Von out of Cuba. And he, him and a couple of the other percussionists in the group invented this style. And it is very much derived from funk. So it has a lot of funk essence into it. But if you ever hear other recordings of this tune, it utilizes this style of Sango. And this style itself has evolved in, during the early 90s into what is known as timba. So if you ever get a chance, check out the band Los Von Von. They're the ones that pioneered this style of sango, and they use this style of timba, which incorporates even more funk. So basically what it entails is in sango, they took cowbell rhythm and just put it in the hi-hat, playing downbeats, right? The drummer with the bass drum is doubling what the bass player is playing, the tumbao rhythm. Okay, and then you have in the snare drum a rhythm. So the three of us are going to play it just to show you what, what we're talking about.
So if you try maybe adding this in the rhythm section, especially with the drummer, if you just play downbeats on the hi-hat, right, or on the right cymbal, and add that tune bow rhythm in your bass drum, you'll match up what your bass player is playing. And it'll help solidify what you're doing on the Latin side. OK, so give that a try, maybe, instead of trying to play mambo. Even though the music tells you mambo, knowing other styles that can fit within what you're playing sometimes can help in generating the groove a little better and tightening things up for you. Any questions about that, Sango? What you were doing on the snare, it kind of sounded a little bit like a, like a second line type of feel. Yeah. So I was adding a lot of ghost notes in there. So okay. it, it actually was kind of like a linear beat. And this is where the funk comes in to that sort of thing. So if that makes sense, I don't know. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. But like, I would totally recommend, I mean, from a drummer to another drummer, if you get the time, look up Sango patterns and learn how to play Sango. And it's really great style to play in bands like the ones you're in, where you can incorporate funk within Latin and it's a really great groove once you get it down. So, so aside from Sango, has anyone familiar with other styles like Brazilian styles like Samba and Bossa Nova? Yes. Yeah. yes, all right, see, gotta know that stuff in a jazz band. Any, any group you ever play with will always play a Bossa Nova, always. And Samba is another popular one. So Samba really, uh, who here knows Samba? Raise your hand if you know Samba. And it's okay if you don't. <laughs> what do you know about samba other than that it's from brazil so basically it defines their culture in brazil and it is really their way of life like everybody in brazil plays samba it is like the thing to do down there the coolest thing i ever saw was a, Bra a guy from brazil came to one of our classes when i was in college once and I've never ever in my life seen someone make a book of matches swing like he did. He tapped his fingers on a box of matches, played a samba on a box of matches and made it swing. So the point I'm trying to make is that's their way of life down there. And it's a big part of their culture and it's what defines them. And so samba comes from the late 1800s and became popular within dance, as a dance style of music or dance music. And it came from like uh, European ball dancing and eventually it got really popular in the 1920s within jazz. And the style itself was popular in what is known as carnival. Has everyone here heard of carnival? Yeah. It's like their version of Mardi Gras, basically. So they have this big parade, all these floats, and then they have these samba bands. And it's, and it's what's known as batucada, and it's their version of drum corps. So in batucada and with samba, it's a very, very rhythmic style. And in Batucada, you have these drums called surdo drums. And the style itself is in a 2-4 meter with an emphasis on two. And the surdo drums are playing just a high and a low, answering each other. One, two, one, two. And the two is the emphasis. So you have something like. OK? That eventually worked its way into the drum set and to the feet. Okay, and then you have what they call the go-go bell pattern, which drummers play in the snare drum a lot. Okay, and then you put that together. And you get a basic samba rhythm right there on a drum set. Then you start adding bass, guitar, and everything else, and now you have it in a jazz idiom, which is really popular. So that tune was actually a bossa nova tune that we played as a samba. So the point, the point of the matter is, is you can take any kind of Latin tune, throw it into a samba, as long as you have the right rhythms and things like that within the style to make it stylistically 
what it is, and then you can change things around. So aside from that, Bossa Nova is the other version from Brazil, right? So basically what Bossa Nova is, is a cooled down version of a samba. And this became popular in the 1950s and 60s with some composers like Antonio Carlos Jobim. You may have heard his most famous standard, Girl from Ipanema. Who here has heard this song? Girl from Ipanema. If you've been in an elevator, you've heard this song. <laughs> So everyone recognizes that, right? Yes. Yeah, we all know that tune. So bossa nova is really, really important to know as a, as a Latin style within jazz. You will always play that, and if you can play that, I guarantee you will play with any band in a restaurant near you. So aside from that, like other things that I like to do as a drummer is I also incorporate other styles within the styles. So we're gonna play for you a song called Green, On Green Dolphin Street, which is a really famous song from switching from Latin to jazz. But some things I will do to help change the intensity of the music, maybe during a solo or something, is I'll add like, like a cha-cha cowbell rhythm, which is just downbeats. Same idea as the cowbell rhythm from like Sango and the hi-hat, but I'll do it on the cross stick on the snare over the bossa nova rhythm. So just listen for that sort of stuff and you'll hear how just doing that can help in changing different sections and the feel of different sections and marking different sections.
All right, th thank you. Any questions or uh, comments about that? Uh, any observations that you've had on, uh, on playing Latin and switching between swing and Latin? Yeah, I'm having I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. You mentioned something about what the bass player did. Uh, he did like a little walk up uh, uh -huh. to the swing section, and I just thought that was really cool, kind of getting into the swing. Absolutely, it's not only the drummer that's that's hinting at the next style, right? Yeah, they're all on the same page about when it's going to happen. So that helps us when he walks it up into the swing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Good R good observation. Rhythm section. You guys got to set the band up. That's your job. Drive the bus. That's right. All right, so uh, we're going to move on and talk about another style that's important in jazz. Uh, and we're going to have our specialist, Johnny Maldonado, talk a little bit about playing funk. <laughs> All right, who here is familiar with the funk? <laughs> All the hands go up. <laughs> well, I, I love funk. Uh, and um, what I love most about it is that it's a melting pot of a lot of different styles. You know, it emerged in the 1960s with a man named James Brown when he came on the scene. And it really came together with him, but it was a culmination of uh, jazz music, uh, R&B, some New Orleans styles, um, rhythm and blues, uh, I said already, gospel, and even rock and roll elements show up in there. Uh, and from the, the big thing about funk is when it started with James Brown is his emphasis on utilizing the 16th notes within a measure. Um, so it's very bass driven, very uh, heavy in the drums, and also the, the guitar changes a little bit. You know, it, it was using elements from electric blues now that you can plug in. And uh, the sound was a little bit more high end than a lot of the other jazz styles that uh, preceded it. And people had a lot more freedom uh, of expression. Now, from the 1960s with James Brown, later on you've got other groups that came out. And uh, if you get a pen or pencil, you should definitely write these down because if you're all into funk, these are some awesome, awesome bands <laughs> to hear. If you like spaceships and synthesizers and Jimi Hendrix kind of stuff, Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton, and the P-Funk All-Stars were really good. Um, later on, uh, if you like more kind of horn-heavy arrangements and kind of tight grooves, check out um, Tower Power. Uh, they had a lot of really great stuff going on, really great guitar work, too, and, and horn work. Um, you know, uh, later on, it kind of, you, uh, you got go-go music with uh, Chuck Brown that had a lot of more spoken word kind of things in it, and uh, percussion, live percussion. Uh, if you're into kind of synthesizers and talk boxes, as much as I am, uh, Zap, uh, Zap and Roger as well, too. And a lot of uh, more modern artists picked up on a lot of these styles. Uh, but before I say that, uh, you've got Miles Davis and Herbie Hancock that had a bunch of really cool funk albums that they were experimenting while they were fusing jazz with that. Also, uh, John McLaughlin as well on some of that, really great guitar player. And um, if you go even further into more uh, today's music from like the 80s and 90s up to now, you've got Prince who's doing a lot of cool stuff with funk. Um, and then uh, Bruno Mars put a lot of fun stuff in there. The Chili Peppers uh, had a lot of rock grooves that went on into the 90s with funk. And uh, now we've got some really exceptional bands like uh, Snarky Puppy, um, another group called Scary Pockets. If you haven't checked them out, definitely check them out. They do a lot of cool versions of pop tunes and funkify them. And um, what else? Funky Knuckles is another great one. So yeah, the, the, the big thing about funk is, yeah, just experimenting with the 16th notes. A lot of the times, if you're arranging it, you're going to have guitar players. Uh, a lot of their shots and, and hits are going on with the snare drums on, uh, with the drummer. You're going to have uh, a lot of the higher frequency horn stabs and stuff doing the same thing. And you know the, the bass is locking really tight with the drums as well. 
So we're going to do a tune that uh, is an original I composed called uh, Pick Up Them Brass Bullets. That's going to have some elements of funk in it and even some uh, bebop head lines. Funky bop. Right.
All right, so that was Pick Up Them Brass Bullets, written by our very own specialist, Johnny Maldonado. Thank you, Johnny. Awesome. So I want to talk just a little bit about how to get started improvising. Uh, how many of you in the band uh, take improvised solos? Let's see a raise of hands. How many take improvised solos? Yeah, we got our trumpet player. We got a guitarist. Good, yeah, yeah, raise them up high. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, one of our trombone players, a little bit, right? Okay. <laughs> So one of the most important things to remember when you're improvising, uh, for me, one of the most important things is having a lack of fear. Everybody has to start somewhere. Um, and, and you can't start off being great at something. So as, as with any skill, it takes time and development. And so it takes a little bit of boldness to just step out and play. Uh, and so... I encourage you all to just take that step, be unafraid to improvise. Um, there are a lot of tools that can help you get good at it. And we'll talk uh, just for a couple minutes about it. We don't have a lot of time left, but um, I wanna highlight there are two major areas that you need to develop to become a good improviser. The first one is your ear training, and the second one is your technique, okay? And they work together. Uh, to uh, help you to play a good solo. All right, so with ear training, you need to work on uh, the most important thing, and we've kind of been saying it all, all morning, is listening. So you listen to the best musicians that you can. Listen to the things that you like to listen to, and listen to things that inspire you. Um, so for me, uh, in my development, that was a lot of Miles Davis when I was young, that was a lot of Chet Baker, uh, that was a lot of Sonny Stitt, um, Blue Mitchell, uh, Lee Morgan, Freddie Hubbard. Uh, these are people that are great for everybody to listen to. Uh, like I said before, uh, I, think, I think I mentioned it before, everybody should listen to the Miles Davis groups. Um, kind of Blue is an excellent album. I, I, uh, I encourage all of you to learn Wynton Kelly's solo on Freddie Freeloader. That's a good one to start with. The tune is called Freddie Freeloader on Kind of Blue uh, from Miles Davis. Uh, so listen to that and learn that solo, and that's a great place to start. But we call that transcribing, when you learn somebody else's solo. Just play it along with the recording. Uh, so that's part of ear training, developing your ear. The other one is developing your technique. So that's your knowledge of theory, scales and arpeggios, patterns, um, being able to play in all keys. So a good place to start is learning all 12 major scales. So learn, you learn your major scales, and then you start working on your modes of the major scale later. And I'm sure your band director can help you with that if you have questions. So work on your mold, modes of major scales. And we like to use a lot of pentatonics as well. Does anybody know what pentatonics means? What does pentatonic mean? Five notes. Five notes, exactly. So we use a lot of pentatonic scales. That's also in a lot of popular music and funk. You'll hear that all over the place, pentatonics. It's really the most basic and universal scale that's used by pretty much every culture all over the world in their traditional music and in their popular music. So I, I very much encourage you to learn your major scales in all 12 keys and your pentatonics in all 12 keys. And that's a really good start for being able to uh, develop your uh, technique for improvisation. So train your ear and work on your technique. Um, and that's about time for us. We've got to get, let our other group uh, start set up, start setting up here. But uh, if there are no further questions, we'll say goodbye and thank you for being such a great class. Say thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.